Week five is not the week to let your idiot league mates beat you on the waiver wire, all right? There's been a lot of fool's gold up to this point. This is not the week in which you allow everybody else to splurge on the wire. You have to hit on some of these players because this is a week where the upside of some of the players available will change the trajectory of your team for the remainder of the fantasy football season. I've got my glasses on today. That is how you know it's serious. I came pre-tucked. We are murder case levels of serious today. So let's jump into the most trending players in fantasy football right now. So normally we'll go down the list and talk about every single player, but I think it's just imperative that we just jump right into the Green Bay Packers situation because Jordan Love is back and that man put up numbers on Sunday. Here's the takeaway. Obviously they got down big. He had to throw the ball a million times, but with Christian Watson out, he suffered a, a pretty serious high ankle sprain, and the rumors are that he's probably going to go on to IR. So that's four weeks, could be up to six weeks. You know those high ankle sprains tend to linger. This dude is no stranger to these types of injuries. And why that's so important is that it condenses the wide receiver room. And that was one of the trickier parts of the summer is figuring out what is the pecking order. Like, I think we've been pretty spot on so far. It felt like we knew Jaden Reed was probably the most talented, but Romeo Dobbs was going to run the most routes. Christian Watson was going to be annoying for fantasy, and Ontavian Wicks would kind of be pushed down to the bottom. Everything changed when Christian Watson got hurt, and we saw both Ontavian Wicks and Jaden Reed explode. Jaden Reed's not available anywhere, but Dontavian Wicks is available in many, 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 many leagues out there. He is my number one waiver wire pickup of the week. He might be my number one waiver wire pickup of the year so far. He is someone that I'd be willing to spend between, you know, 25 if you don't think you need him, 30, 35, 40 percent of my fab. Because at this point in the season, you want to start tying your teams to high upside teams. With Jordan Love back, this is going to be one of the highest scoring offenses in the NFL. And you don't have like random breakout players like a Dontavian Wicks who goes into a big role. Like you very rarely have handcuff wide receivers in fantasy football. You have handcuff running backs. And we'll talk about dudes like Trey Sermon and Tank Bigsby in a little bit. Very rarely do you have high upside handcuff type of wide receivers Dontavian Wicks is one of them. I don't expect Romeo Dobbs to be available in many leagues, but both of them would be my top two pickups if they are available. Romeo Dobbs is number two there. Dontavian Wicks would be number one. If we jump over to Fantasy Life and their utilization report, which you can go get on their website if you have a membership, code BDGE will get you 20% off. We could see in week four here, Dontavian Wicks, for the first time all season, ran more than 52% of the team's routes. He jumped all the way up to 80. The same number that Jaden Reed had, a little bit underneath Romeo Dobbs. Romeo Dobbs will continue to be a player that Jordan Love likes. And Romeo Dobbs is a good possession receiver. He catches shit. Dante Avian Wicks has had a little bit of a drop problem this year, but he is such a big play waiting to happen and so explosive, and he'll take a lot of those downfield targets that Christian Watson was getting and not converting. Ontavian Wicks, his first game with 80% of the routes, 29% target per route run rate, a 26% target share, an average depth of target of 16.5 with a 39% air yard share, 80% of the end zone targets. What are we doing here? So Dontavian Wicks is the prize possession for this week. Romeo Dobbs is slightly behind him, but most likely owned in your league. If we move over to the tight end spot for the Green Bay Packers, I love Tucker Craft. As it relates to Dobbs, uh, it's important not to be too reactionary. Everyone's going to come off this game and be like, of course, you know, Wicks is the number one priority add there. And I agree with that because he has upside on a weekly basis that I don't think Dobbs has. Like Wicks, five for 78, two touchdowns. 13 targets, which led the team, and the type of targets he's getting are very valuable. Where Romeo Dobbs is coming off a game where he also had eight targets, the same number of Jaden Reed had, but he only went four for 39. So we're looking at Romeo Dobbs like, oh, we didn't see the production there. So he's kind of moving down the list for us. Had he gone six for 75 and a touchdown, we'd probably be looking at him a little bit differently. But Tucker Craft is a dude I really want to pinpoint where a lot of teams are struggling at tight end. Guys who have Kyle Pitts, guys who have Mark Andrews, David Njoku, Evan Ingram, like all of these top tight ends are just fluttering and putting you up fucking donuts in your lineup. Tucker Craft has nine targets in this offense. Six catches, 53 yards, and a touchdown. If we go look at the numbers for Tucker Craft, he ran 86% of the routes. Luke Musgrave has become a complete afterthought. He saw 25% of the team's third and fourth down targets. There's another row right next to that that you guys can't see because my big-ass fucking brain is in the way. He saw 43% of the team's play-action targets. When they put the tight ends on the field, the opposing offenses are like, ah, shit, we've got a big formation. They're probably running the ball. Wrong. Play action. Tucker Craft, how you doing? Tucker Craft is a dude that if you are desperate at tight end, I would 
I would legitimately think about throwing anywhere from like 8 to 12% of your fab on this dude. Again, now is the time where if there are upside contingent players, or if there if there are dudes who could have upside for the entirety of the rest of the season attached to a Green Bay offense that's going to be top five in scoring, you want those pieces on your team. So we'll move off of Green Bay. You want Wicks, you want Dobbs, you want Sucker Craft, you want these players. You also want Emmanuel Wilson if you're a Jacobs owner, or Emmanuel Wilson just to kind of stash if you have a, a luxury spot on your bench because he is a relatively high upside player if something were to happen to Jacobs. But let's continue moving down the actual trending tab here. We have Trey Sermon, and he's atop the list because Jonathan Taylor suffered what is believed to be a minor high ankle sprain. I don't know if that exists. Most people that I've listened to and consumed injury content on so far uh, this morning would say that Taylor is very likely to miss this week. Uh, there's probably a good chance he misses next week as well. Maybe like a Joe Mixon type of uh, energy going on there. So anywhere from one to you know three, four weeks, maybe these things linger. So Trey Sermon should step in. He took most of the work when Taylor was not on the field last week. The problem with Trey Sermon is through four NFL seasons, he has seven combined receptions. He's also just not that good of a runner, obviously. It feels a little bit like this guy over here. Uh, on the right side of the screen, Cam Akers, where he was just like shoved into a workhorse role. But I think there's a good chance that Tyler Goodson ends up playing a pass catching role in Indianapolis here, which kind of like ruins Trey Sermon's upside. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in Trey Sermon as being anything more than like a, a desperate flex play. Like he should get 14, 15 touches, but he's not a big play running back. Uh, if he doesn't get a goal line touch there, then you're probably looking at a, a a relatively shitty floor play. Uh, so I, I think that being said, if you're really desperate at running back, I think you could go and, and drop somewhere between like five and 7%. The one that you do want, obviously, is Mr. Kareem Hunt here because the guy over here, Carson Steele, when the Carson Steele week kind of happened where he was a top waiver wire pickup of the week, my dumb ass spent a lot of money on him in our, our in-office league. However, in the waiver wire video, my sentiment was basically what I told you guys to do was Eight to ten percent on Carson Steele, eight to ten percent on Kareem Hunt, because we didn't really know how the backfield was going to play out. Now Kareem Hunt was active in this game. Obviously, Carson Steele came out and immediately fumbled the fucking ball, got put right in the doghouse, and that led to Kareem Hunt taking over the backfield. Fourteen carries, sixty-nine yards, caught two balls for sixteen yards as well. Now I think the overall conversation that has to be had here, right? We talked about Green Bay. Let's just jump into Kansas City. The Kansas City offense is simply just not the fantasy gold mine that people have in their heads I, I heard a stat the other day that like I don't think Kansas City has scored more than 30 points in I don't know 16 games or something like that there there's just a lot of low upside stuff happening in Kansas City it felt like it was going to be this brand new offense this year but with Rice out with Hollywood out with Travis Kelsey playing like a 45 year old and Xavier Worthy being not much more than like a deep field gadget player there are, and, and no Pacheco, like this offense is not good outside of Pacheco playing like, or uh, Mahomes playing like Superman. So I think it's really important not to overvalue this position that the Kansas City Chiefs weapons are in. Now, that being said, you obviously want to pick up Kareem Hunt in case he ends up being like the guy in that backfield. Does he offer a lot of big playability? Not really. Is he going to be the one on the goal line? I don't know. Would it surprise anyone if they got to the one-yard line next week and Carson Steele is the back again? Samaji P. Ryan took a goal line carry and scored the touchdown this week. It's also important to note that Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is eligible and apparently expected to return to the team this week coming off of IR. Don't know if he'll be active. Don't know if he'll play, whatever. There's obviously still reports that we need to hear on that. Uh, but the situation is a lot trickier than last week's box score presents. I also think there's a chance that Pacheco comes back by around week 10. So, like, maybe you have a fringe RB2 flex for four to five weeks. All to say, I wouldn't drop more than, like, you know, 8 to 10% of fab on Kareem Hunt right now on the waiver wire. And I think we can throw a lot of dudes underneath Kareem Hunt as, like, handcuff guys. Like, Justice Hill, I get it. He's had a couple big games. He's, like, operated as their top receiver in a couple games. But there's also been a handful of games where he's going to get you, like, zero or one points. And there's just... No world where I'm trying to throw a dude in my flex who can conceivably get me one, zero, one, or two points. So 
Hill to me is like a he's not even a handcuff because if Derrick Henry goes down, like there's no way they don't get another back involved or sign like some veteran off the streets or something. So Hill is whatever. Tank Bigsby, I think, falls into that same category. Had a big game, but like also did that in week one. Nothing came of it. So I'm not like overly hyped up on him. I think Clyde Edwards Hilaire is a reasonable stash, just again to see how that backfield actually plays out when he's there. What other running backs we got here? Rico Dowdle's not available in any serious league. Tay Algier is also just, you know, a handcuff. Uh, Alexander Madison, same thing. I think Madison has a chance to take over as a starting running back and getting more touches. But like we've also said the same thing about him and like Bucky Irving and all these guys basically every single week. And until you see it, it's hard to actually like act on it or do anything worthwhile. Uh, the screen cuts off here on the bottom, but after Darnell Mooney, it's Romeo Dobbs. And it says he's rostered in 56% of leagues. Darnell Mooney is 66. So let's jump back up. And as it relates to the Kansas City receiver situation, what I think is going to end up happening is, I mean, it's going to be a bad passing offense, realistically. I don't I don't really know what the identity of this offense becomes. The, the real winner here is obviously Travis Kelsey. We saw him really step up last week after Rashi Rice went down, had a ton of targets, had a ton of receptions. And I think it's easy to say that like Rice took the Kelsey role. But the thing about what made Rice so good was like he had actual like real explosion. He was able to separate on slant plays. He was able to make huge plays after the catch. There were like design slants that went to him. And sometimes they do that with Kelsey. A lot of Kelsey and Mahomes together and a lot of the greatness of Kelsey is his ability to improvise in the middle of a play. His abil ability to wait for Mahomes to scramble out of the pocket. Kelsey find the open spot once he's scrambling. Where sure, Kelsey, Kelsey's going to see a big uptick in targets. Like obviously if you have him, you know, he becomes an every week starter again for tight end. You really lucked out if you were a Travis Kelsey owner right now because it didn't look good and now it looks great. Kelsey, big winner. The other ones, like Watson's going to run a ton of routes. He's going to have like one or two big games over the course of the season, but you'll never feel comfortable starting him in your lineup. Juju Smith-Schuster becomes like semi-interesting, but this is the problem with Juju is he's just so not a good player anymore that you could say like, oh, he's going to take the Rashi Rice role. But again, Rashi Rice wasn't succeeding just because he was attached to Patrick Mahomes or in an Andy Reid offense. Rashi Rice was succeeding because... He was so explosive on those underneath routes. He was so explosive on the slant plays. He was able to gain separation within, you know, half a second of the snap happening where I don't have faith that Juju's going to do that. Can Juju come out here and go, you know, 6 four, fifty, and maybe score a touchdown uh, every few weeks or something like that? Yeah, I think you can do worse. He would probably be my, my add in this offense if I'm going to target a wide receiver, but we're not trying to blow our fab that the, the Kansas City overall situation is actually the most fool's gold situation of the week in my opinion let's talk a little super flex because we've got Anthony Richardson dealing with the hit pointer now we have to be careful here because the hit pointer is a pain tolerance thing it is not considered serious by pretty much anyone that I've listened to any doctor whose content I've consumed However, it came out that he is also dealing with an ab strain and an oblique strain, two different strains, and those are more concerning. There is a very real chance that he misses this upcoming week because of those things. This is something that Kenneth Walker just dealt with, uh, dealt with and, and missed multiple weeks. Obviously, different position, different player, all that kind of stuff could be a pain tolerance thing as well, but the strain is real. It's going to take a couple of weeks to get back to 100%. So there, there's a chance that Anthony Richardson plays this week. There's also a chance that he misses next week. There's a chance that he misses two weeks with these strains. So that being said, Joe Flacco obviously stepped in and played phenomenally. And I think he is extremely startable this week. You can pick him up in super flex drafts, uh, super flex leagues, and probably start him against Jacksonville immediately. And that's the other thing I should mention about Trey Sermon is like Jacksonville's pasty is atrocious. But again, we just saw Cam Akers, who I compared him to, playing in Jacksonville, had no success on the ground. They're a, a relatively decent run defense, not a good pass defense, though. So with Joe Flacco, uh, he is definitely pick upable and probably startable as a low end QB two, you know, maybe QB eighteen ish in that range immediately. Again, he is a one week fill in. There are a decent amount of quarterbacks on a bye this upcoming week. We have Jalen Hurts, we have Jared Goff, we have Justin Herbert, and we have the Titans. So like, I don't even know who the fuck the quarterback's going to be in week six. Probably Will Levis, but um, but yeah, if you need a one a one week fill in, uh, I think Flacco's probably worth throwing a little bit of fab on but again you know it, it, it's not going to be a long-term solution for you in that offense too josh downs is another dude that i i feel like needs to be way more fucking respected there's there's a few receivers at the top of the waiver wire list this week that i think are legitimately worth spending a decent chunk of, of fab on as i said it was dontavian wicks it was romeo dobbs 
right underneath those two, there are three receivers where I think a 12 to 15% fab bid are extremely, extremely reasonable. Josh Downs is one of them. He has now come back from the high ankle sprain and looked 100% himself. Eight for 82 and a touchdown with Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco's a quarterback again. Like, he has legitimate upside. Josh Downs in fantasy. He, he one, I, th- I think he's just underrated as a player. He's a really good wide receiver. And he offers more explosive ability, offers more upside, in my opinion. The next guy that I want to talk about was Wondell Robinson. Now, we've been talking about Wondell Robinson as, as like, the PPR scam of the century right now. Another 14 targets last week. Malik Neighbors dealing with a concussion. Uh, because it was Thursday night, there's a really good chance he ends up playing this upcoming week. But if he doesn't, Wondell's probably in for another double-digit target game. Wondell and Josh Downs are similar to me. Wondell has a higher target floor and ceiling, probably. But Josh Downs offers way more explosive ability and big play ability as compared and touchdown ability as compared to Wondell Robinson. So both of those dudes need to be owned, need to be picked up and can be played immediately this week, as well as the rookie Xavier Leggett. He was a guy that, you know, we talked about last week, definitely worth picking up and seeing how the Carolina offense plays itself out. Now, Leggett came out, led the team in targets, 10 targets, six catches. 66 yards, and he scored the touchdown. Obviously, there's been so much life injected into this Carolina passing offense since Dalton has come onto the scene. Deontay Johnson is playing like a wide receiver one. You see Leggett, obviously, huge boost since Adam Thielen went down. He jumped up to 88% of the routes, 24% target per route run rate, 24% target share. Overall, 26% of the air yards, 33% of the end zone targets. Where Jonathan Mingo actually ran more routes than him is just not as good of a player, clearly, by the fact that he can't earn targets. His average depth of target is 2.8 yards. He's being used uh, around the line of scrimmage or not really being used at all. So Leggett is this really huge, athletic, explosive player that makes some bad mistakes as any rookie or like kind of inconsistent athlete like him does. But he offers a ton of upside that I think could be something that stays the part throughout the entire year. And you're seeing Carolina continually getting in high scoring games because their defense is so bad. They just lost um, a a few more players on their defense. I think it was Shaq Thompson, uh, Juicy, uh, I can't remember his fucking name. The double J alliteration. Uh, Shy Tuttle is also out there defense. Like they were already bad and now they're just getting worse and worse and worse. Going to allow a lot of points. Andy Dalton's going to throw the ball a ton. Xavier Leggett is without a doubt someone that, again, like you talk about dudes that can have upside for the entire season. He's one of those guys. Continuing down, Trey Tucker is a decent flex ed. Uh, if Devontae Adams continues to miss time here, he's scored in back-to-back games. So something to keep an eye on. Tutu Atwell has been the best fantasy wide receiver in LA since Cup and Puka have gone down. I legitimately think you can pick him up and start him uh, immediately versus Green Bay. This week, he's gone back-to-back games of over 80 receiving yards, as you could see. The target numbers are a little bit shaky, but this is against San Fran. This is against Chicago. Now he gets a home game against Green Bay that just allowed about a bajillion points to the Minnesota Vikings. Four for 93, four for 82, getting very valuable targets. So really like Tutu Atwell. Also really like his teammate, Jordan Winnington. Now, Jordan Winnington was not a full-time player whatsoever until this previous week. He ended up jumping up to 97% of the snaps. So Tyler Johnson is a complete afterthought. Demarcus Robinson is literally somehow producing worse than he was when Puka and Cooper Cup were both there. I guess that makes sense, just given the attention. Uh, But Jordan Winnington is literally playing the Puka and Cooper Cup role. So that is really worth noting. And if we look at the target per route run rate, that's where things kind of jump off the screen to me and why I feel like he's kind of a priority add for the next few weeks. Jordan Winnington, 97% of the routes, 26% target per route run rate, 30% of the team's targets overall, 50% of the end zone targets. That is that though he's legitimately playing the the Puka role. Okay. And that's where like Matt Stafford feels comfortable throwing the ball. So Whittington could be a real, real PPR player over the next month of the season as their other receivers start to get back into the swing of things and hopefully get healthy. But Whittington was a dude who was red hot during the preseason, got a ton of hype, and people compared him to Puka at the time. Uh, he was a dynasty pickup like you needed throughout the uh, throughout the summer, and now he's finally getting that real role. I think we're going to see a lot of really good PPR games out of Jordan Whittington going forward. Yeah, I mean, there's no one else really on this list that I feel like is available on your guys' waiver wires this week. So we can jump into some of my favorite streaming defenses for the week. And as always, I kind of have a a little bit of a program for this where I'm looking at teams with uh, spreads that are projecting them to win their game. We want a team that's going to win their game. We want home teams 
And typically, the bigger the spread, the better. It means more passing for the other team, more interceptions, sacks, all those kind of things. So what I'll normally do is jump into some sort of sports book that has the odds here, if it's you know DraftKings or whatever, and look at teams that I think are available, like Vikings defense is not available. We're looking at teams that are at home. Washington, minus three and a half at home. I don't love that because I don't believe that Washington actually has a good defense. However, Cleveland's offensive line is completely cooked right now, and Deshaun Watson is taking about 10 sacks a game. So you could do worse, but they would not be my priority add. Chicago, uh, I love that at minus four over under 42. They're also a really good real life defense. So if they're available, they're one of my favorites to pick up. San Fran won't be available on anyone's waiver wire. Seattle would be my play of the week for sure here. Seattle is six and a half point favorites at home. New York has to travel all the way across country. Seattle's defense has been, you know, they got shit on last night, but that's the Detroit offense for you. They were without a lot of their defensive players, so I will keep an eye on the injury reports. They were without like three or four of their top front seven players, which is why Detroit was able to run the ball so successfully against them. So hopefully they get a couple of those players back, but I would really, really highly suggest looking at Seattle for this week, given the spread, given the matchup, given the home matchup. Uh, And then KC minus five against the Saints. I don't hate that either. So we'll leave you at that. We've got the week five waiver wire. Go drop the fab, go drop the budget, come back with an empty wallet tomorrow morning. All right. Hopefully this was helpful. If you enjoyed and you want to see next week's waiver wire, of course, subscribe to the channel. We have our running back rankings and our wide receiver rankings coming out tomorrow. We've got our favorite trade targets coming out Thursday. And then as always, we've got our private Q&A on Saturdays where I answer any of y'all sit start questions. If you are a big dog member, which you can go sign up for on BDGE.co or the cheapest way is by going to Underdog Fantasy and using promo code BDGE. When you deposit $10 or more for the first time, you will get a deposit match. You'll get a deposit bonus. You will get a free square of half a passing yard for one of the players in Thursday Night Football and a free year membership of the Big Dog membership. All right. Love y'all. Underdog Fantasy. Co-BDGE. Smoochies.